Hi everyone. Hey. <laughs> hello, hello. John. Hey, it's not the usual place, John. Yeah. <laughs> jump, hey. jump over. Uh, where's my camera? How can? Why doesn't my camera work? Oh, well. oh there we go. There we go. How's it? Alrighty. Uh, all right. Yeah, I, <laughs> not not much more, not much less, but but okay. <laughs> okay, okay good. How about you? How are the things? Yeah, fine. I think um, I can. I think I left early, didn't I? The discussion last 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 time. You guys were quite involved in the discussion about what uh, what you were going to plan for the coming set coming days and weeks, and um, you were talking about design stuff a lot. And, Kind of uh, yeah, I yeah, <laughs> yeah. Doing the the community work too technical for me. Yeah, yeah. It was a bit. Uh, it was not the the session I hoped that we could have, oh. but yeah, it okay. was maybe too much on the um, already too too much on the on the subject and a bit less about. Uh, uh, you know, how do we constrain the the discussion in a you know good enough way for us to say, okay, let's let's do it this way and and let's see what happens. Uh, but uh, but we will have um, an opportunity to to uh, to clarify that in and I hope we we could uh, plan something in uh, the coming weeks. Because it's a it's an interesting topic. Hi, Mark. Yep. <laughs> Greetings, all. Hey, Mark. Oh yeah. Lena, I love we we see the yeah we see the the orange uh, thing, but we we don't see your face. It's like you are in the <laughs> in the dark. <laughs> yeah, I like it in the dark. That's <laughs> You're about to rob a train. <laughs> I've actually been sick. I couldn't attend the, the workshop on Thursday. I had a cold, so I'm holding this for my, my, my throat. I wanted to keep it cold, uh, to keep it warm. So, yeah, I do like to put this before the start of any session. Like, <laughs> yeah, anarchy. <laughs> it, 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 is, it is so... But... That that wouldn't feel nearly as as anarchy like today as it would have two years ago. Like I, I literally I find myself walking into places. I don't go that many places just because of where we're at with the pandemic here. But like, and you see people all in masks. And there's times where I sit back there and think, it wasn't that long ago that people would have just thought, "Oh my God, what is about to happen?" Whereas now you just I don't, I don't even think anything of it. <laughs> Yeah. It's been really funny because before the pandemic, uh, I was in Amsterdam and there was this ongoing discussion. I was in this uh, in West, so there were a lot of Muslim people and there were a lot of discussions on whether they are allowed to wear burqa, burqa or a hijab or, you know, cover their faces. And they're like, no, it's not. What if, you know, they're terrorists and things like that? There was a very, you know, racist discourse around it. And now everyone is wearing masks. And you're like, anyone could be a terrorist. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, hiding your face. Yeah. It's, uh, well, it shows how although, it hey, actually, if you think about that in terms of design and context, what a, what a great example of that. Yes. Uh, now... If, if I was going to go to the bank or go to a liquor store, which are two you know popular places to rob, uh, with a mask, no one would blink. In fact, in fact, they would get upset if I did not have a mask. Yeah, but, I mean, like, it's not necessarily the same kind of mask, right? <laughs> yeah, it's not like uh, well, you know care? the monkey face uh, mask or I don't know what. <laughs> You're going with three of your friends wearing like masks of dead presidents. You oh know, yeah, like... <laughs> that's different. Well, anything that works, you know. There's no such thing as the best mask, but the mask that's you know that suits you. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's design. But but oh, that but I can I can tell you I can tell you what mask pisses off the right wingers more than any other. 
<laughs> oh yeah. Oh baby. I Which got, one? Uh, I got accosted on Saturday. I was wearing an N ninety five. Oh and, no. Uh, this right wing <laughs> lunatic lost his shit on me and just started yelling in my face because I was wearing an N ninety five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was pretty funny. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, it was pretty it got to, um I mean it's not like Ottawa here, but downtown Vancouver on uh on Saturday was uh it was a real demonstration and it was it I thought it was gonna end in violence. Because it was really? really it was really it was a small number of people, but they were uh highly provocative and aggressive and really in your face. So yeah, it was pretty bad. Well, yeah, I loved it. I had a really good time. I, I like pissing those people off. So wearing the N95 mask was really not a problem for me. <laughs> but I think you know, they would be afraid of you because I think you're like a tall, big guy. So they wouldn't be so quick to, to jump on your throat. <laughs> this, guy, this guy was pretty big, but he got really upset because I basically stopped and stared at him. And I was just looking at him in the eyes. And I said, I said, you know, I don't think... I've ever spent this long next to somebody this stupid before in my life. And he <laughs> lost it. <laughs> just lost it. And I just stayed calm. But yeah. But yeah, it's pretty bad. I mean, Cameron, you know what's going on in Ottawa right now. I mean it's Yeah. Yeah, it's we've got a real we have a we have a Trump problem in Canada in a way that is <laughs> shocking, disappointing, disheartening, um, gut wrenching. Yeah, it's it's horrible right now. Okay. And really it's super it's it's, it's a minority like a small minority of people that they are loud and visible and uh and real like really disappointing to see but, you know. yeah so do you mean there's there were con contamination of uh oh i lost you guys sorry it, it was supposed to be a an anti-vaccination mandate Protest, especially starting with the truckers, who oh, need yeah. that, who yeah. needed to get across the border, and um, and a bunch of people have like decided to leave their job. Quick turned into a right wing, uh, you know, like a real. the nation's capital right now is overrun by about they figure it's about 15,000 people who are like really causing trouble um and and they're not because they're white they're not doing anything if this was first nations people in this country the rcmp would be all over them and in their face but it's because they're these racist white nationalists and you know we don't our cops aren't immune from that and uh yeah everything just kind of They should really just be cleaning it out, but they're not. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a remarkable. I get, I probably like most people. I sit and think a little bit about you know what can be done, and you know of course because the issue is is that you know there's the what started as a kernel of legitimacy. So you can argue against what, what you know, vaccine mandates are, are tricky things. And I think one of the issues that the truck drivers who came in originally had was that they're being asked on both sides of the border. So it's not it's not as simple as they they're somewhat making it out to be. But is that if you want to cross the Canadian border of the United States, you have to have a, a vaccine and you have to all that sort of stuff. So um, one argument that people are making is that, well, I'm a truck driver and yes, I do come into contact with people, but like when I unload at a grocery store or a department store, the people that I'm working with, they don't have to have a mandate. So why should I have to have a mandate? All the, all the people across the supply chain that I interact with don't have to have a, a vaccine mandate. So why do I, that to me, that's a legitimate thing to get, get complaining about. I'm mm. not, you know, whether you like vaccines or stuff like this. But then, what, of course, what's happened is, is that that initial idea has turned in. Story. Slightly different thing. 
And then, it, and then it just starts, then what ends up happening is you have all these other groups jumping on board going, great, this is our chance to mm. voice our loosely held set of beliefs together. And this is where you end up getting, literally, you've got people got the Nazi swastika. I'm like, and just think, what on earth? And it's just ballooned into this horrible, mm. horrible thing, which... But it's. Um, I, I have to think. It's, you know, uh, from it's a design the, perspective. How does one design around it? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's a, yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, I think it's an interesting way of seeing some kind of, you know, common attractors in the discourse. Although, in the specificities, maybe not everyone agrees with the you know anti-vax uh, um, <clears throat> discourse. But they, they find some value in the fights that they you know that's um, right arise in the in the discourse and even if people don't agree necessarily with the with the premise of the of the fight they they see a value in the fight itself like it's it's for them as well so it's it's you know it's it's the, the same kind of of um, what we call tropes, like, you know, uh, something that creates um, a specific moment in, in time where, where people will converge to something that even if they don't all agree with it, uh, they find, they find them, them, themselves in, in some way and they, they agree to participate uh, because they, they see more value in, in doing so than not doing so. So I, I find it interesting, but it's you know it's, it's same like um, um, if you if you take the movie uh, Joker, I don't know if you see you, you saw this movie, that the guy is just insane, okay, and it's not the guy itself that himself that started the the um, the um, <clears throat> the riots, um, but it's it's the context, and this guy is just um, an artifact of this context. And through its actions, uh, he managed to create this kind of, you know, common attractors. Because if you take each narrative of each person in the street at this time, I'm sure they won't all agree with what is happening. But they see, like, the, the same kind of, you know, basic roots of, this, you know, uh, not feeling happy or disagreement on what is happening now. And... Yeah, they bring it in this fight their own personal beliefs, although they are not necessarily agree with the, you know, what the t the tip of the iceberg is is saying, right? So it's the same kind of thing, uh, uh, and it's hard to it's hard to You're you know counter basic masses. Yeah, and 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 the fact is, it's hard to address the the mass because you have to address, you know. Uh, conflicting point of views within the group. So you cannot say, oh, we will do something and it will make everyone happy, you know, in this kind of situation. You, yeah, so that's a good question. How do you manage these kind of situations? And yeah, uh, I mean, I think, there, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there are two, there are two things. Sorry, there, there's like, so we've got communication design and we have information design, mm. right? And I think that, the, given the rise of technology, like that, that was the kind of like when I went to go do my master's, that was the communication design was kind of like the sub theme to the whole thing. That was a world prior to Facebook, right? And I kind of, I kind of wonder, given everything else, what are the parameters now of the skills that you need to actually do communication design or information mm. design, right? Like. And, and it's, it is tricky because you want to stay away from like this notion of like coercion or anything like that in design, right? That you definitely, you know, you're always dealing with like persuasion and incentives and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And there's a slippery slope between that and, um, you know, manipulation, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and this, and if we bring this back to the larger umbrella topic, which is, um, Kevin, what we talked about last week, which is like the role of the designer in mm -hmm. society. And, and if we think about that, I always go back to that part 
at um, Plato's Republic, when he talks about like, essentially the domain of knowledge, right? Of the, the shoemaker, like the shoemaker's place in the world is to understand the world of shoes, right? Mm -hmm. And the politician's place is to understand the world like people. So, so what is the, like, what is it that we need to know as designers? What is our sphere, right? Of that. And then it can kind of like branch down. So what's our role? What's the sphere of knowledge and influence? If we then look down at the smaller kind of like subdivisions that are kind of artificial, but are there of like communication design. How does this kind of world of misinformation change that skill set, right? And, and what we need to know, because one of the things that I observed and, and I find like the high irony of this is like a bunch of guys like this tool that was like yelling in my face saying, you know, think for yourself, mm. right? But he is essentially part of a cult that believes everything that Joe Rogan tells them. You know, <laughs> and they don't see the irony of the fact that they are in fact not thinking for themselves. They're actually a herd of like 10% of the people who take exactly what's given to them in the form of conspiracy theories because the world is fast and the data is confusing, nuance Uh, they exhibit the same thing that good brands exhibit, which is the cult notion of loyalty beyond reason. Yeah. Right. Like that's actually something that you want in a brand, like in the, when you get into that manipulation. So there is like this, there's this kind of like tying together of all this kind of thinking about the place of that narrative and who crafts that narrative and our role in crafting that narrative. Anyway, that's it. That was yeah. my kind of like attempt to kind of like put a circle and kind of connect this. But yeah. And there's a deeper. Do you think there would be? Uh, yeah, go sorry, ahead. Just to ask. Go ahead. Mark, go ahead do you ahead. think there's like a sphere of design? Do you would you see that Plato's Republic lays oh. out these as separate layers, or is it mm. more intertwined than that? Because I was reading on uh, Karl Popper, and he has mm. this uh, concept of the, of the three worlds. So he talks yeah. about world one with objects, living, non-living. Then there's the subjective world, and then the third world is. The world that contains things, the world of creativity, uh, art, language, and it has, in a way, I think it has an autonomy of its own. That's why masses are led by very short slogans and things that you kind of abide to because there's autonomy in the language itself and you kind of have to surrender mm -hmm. it because, you know, if you start thinking, you stop acting in that sense and you have to move with the crowd. And, so, and people yes, confuse it with simplicity, by the way. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> simplicity and clarity because you yeah, have yeah, a yeah. sense of clarity yeah uh, knowing what you're doing uh, yeah. but i'm thinking about the designer does the designer have a place in the world like a specific place or it has to kind of go in between all these things and try to mm. you know match the design itself the blueprints are kind of intertwined otherwise to other things can i design a cup that it's not going to be used by users you know by someone who drinks it's doesn't it you know have this affordance uh quality that it, mm -hmm. it's kind of bent around it yeah i, I mean i think so I, I find popper fascinating in this sense and i think you're right it's a really interesting connection so to me that's that's super interesting i i feel like the way i think about my role it has to do with the future so if you take the um oh wait hold on i'm gonna lose the name here um oh I'm nuts I had it in my head i always have it in my head um the guy who wrote uh the engineer who wrote about design very famous very early on essentially um don norman no 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 prior 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 to norman sciences of the artificial um cameron you know, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he wrote like, basically he said he had made this like, right, this kind of grand sweeping gesture um, of like, essentially anybody who is making plans for the uh, paraphrasing, anybody who's making plans for the future is designing. Right. And so mm -hmm. in some way, that notion of a future alternative to the current situation is where we ply our trade, right? That there's a current situation that is inadequate. There's a future. Uh, situation that is preferable for some group of people, our role is to navigate the materialization of that 
kind of future vision in whatever ways. And, and I can see that we work in three different kind of layers, not kind of like proper layers, but there's like a strategic layer where you assess the goal and, and how it is to get there. There's a tactical layer where you deploy things to make it happen. And then there's the layer of execution underneath, which is the execution of potentially the medium itself, right? Gestalt principles in design, um, turns of phrase, you know, the use of language. And if you, if you break that down, somehow we have to, depending on where you are in the stack of a designer and how much experience you have, you kind of move up, you do more strategy, less tactics and less execution. And at the beginning, you do mostly execution. And the, you know, that's one way to think about the things that we, that we do. Um, the deployment of those things absolutely and necessarily have to do with context, right? That you can't apply those things without context. And that Diana is where that notion of that space of, of pinging between things and manipulating things uh, is that, I mean, I think our role is in there somewhere in molding mm -hmm. context or using the context to deploy, um, which I think is interesting. And then the other thing, you're talking about affordance, super fascinating notion of language in there. And one of the really interesting things, and this takes me way back, is this notion that, think of a, think of a ruin. There is a point, I did, I wrote my, half of my undergraduate thesis on this decaying barn between uh, Montreal and Ottawa that I used to drive back and forth past every year. And the thing that to me was fascinating about this was that it was exactly at the place where it still had houseness, but also had ruin. And linguistically, something super interesting was happening where this thing is no longer just a house, but it's becoming like a ruin and, that's, and its definition is slipping. And there are some really interesting things that happen in language there that when you say like, is it a cup and does it have an affordance at what point can it no longer be called a cup? And at that transitional kind of language point, mm -hmm. it, it's a sign to us that something is happening with that object. So this kind of notion of like obsolescence, not like obsolete, but on the way to becoming obsolete, you know, um, and so it, it's, it's really interesting. And, and a lot of things have that, like train cars that are turned into restaurants. You know, like yeah. there's that kind of like, like, what, like, what is it? At what point did it like lose its train carness? How much of that does it retain? What does that tell us about what's happening? Renovations are like that, you know, like somebody moves into a church or something. You know, there's these kind of, there's these amazing friction points where that happens. I find that stuff like super fascinating. Mm hmm Anyway, yeah, that was a, that, I just something I get super excited about is that kind of slipping language stuff. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, one of the things, though, tied to that, though, that's it's interesting is that I, I think it still struggles for us. I'm using us in the global sense. To moving things are, and transitioning things are difficult. Because you're right, like, what's the... It's easy to say this is my this is my mouse. It's a mouse. It's a mouse. It's a mouse. I'm fairly confident in it. There's no issues with it. But but Mark, what you're talking about this idea about like at what point is it? It's got some of both. At what point is it one or the other? And how much of one or the other is in in this? And then all of a sudden, and that that is interesting. And and I think that that actually comes. Is a great way of, of thinking a little bit about even just this phenomenon right here where I'm maybe I'm being charitable, but I'm thinking the guy that was yelling at you at this protest is not somebody who just makes a habit of yelling at people. He probably yells at people more than the average person, but like prior to the pandemic, wouldn't have likely encountered you and said, you know, got really angry because of your coffee choice, for example. And he's like so angry that you're choosing to get a coffee that's not it. Like there's something that's happened that has transitioned a number of different behaviors and given permission to some of those things. But now all of a sudden something like a mask. Like when you when you step back with it, whatever somebody's perspective is on whether you know the government should be telling you what to do government government society tells us what to do all the time like there's tons of laws but why lot people have locked into something like a mask 
like think about how ridiculous it is that anybody mm-hmm. should give a damn that you want to put on an N95 mask. But yet it's become something because it's symbolic of something. It's symbolic of, of a slip between, you know, all of a sudden you walking down the street with something to protect, you know, filter out particles in, in your mouth has turned into some social statement, some political mm-hmm. statement, some statement of value and who you and thus who someone else is. I, that's mm. kind of amazing when you think about it. Yeah. I mean, I think some of this stuff was probably latent in these people and now they found each other. There's a yeah. large what's happening. The high irony of it was is the reason I was wearing an N95 mask outside is because I was going from one store into another and I didn't feel like taking it off in between. Right. And so yeah. not only not only was his anger like crazy, it was completely misplaced. You know, like here you have to wear a mask to go into these stores. It, right? it was so, misplaced like, for, for you, but in his point of view, for what he was doing in this context, <laughs> it was it was probably justified in his point of view. It's where it's where it's where oh, it, was, yeah. it, it is interesting yeah. to see where where context co- uh, you know collide together and 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 mix and yeah. and some kind of you know misunderstanding occurs. It's like uh, uh, yeah, and and I do feel it really interesting the discussion around uh, words and concepts and you know objects as catalysts uh, in in a yeah. sense. And uh, and we, we had this discussion uh, earlier today with uh, Vinish and, and the Slack. Um, um, he was asking about if we think in the in the in, you know in in working with with complexity, if simplicity was a goal uh, to it, it was a goal uh, in in general that we we seek. Uh, com- simplicity as a way to navigate complexity. And I replied that to me, simplicity is just a means for understanding. And, and in some way, it, it is a catalyst. And in, if you take it in this context where, where what we were discussing right now, like the, the, the mask was a catalyst for something or, you know, the, the, um, this idea of uh, the fight that some people are willing to take <clears throat> against... Uh, vaccination or whatever is uh, a catalyst because because it is not the justification in itself for what they are doing it's just some kind of um, vector for what they what they had in mind at the beginning or what they believed at the beginning so it's some kind of you know if we if think in terms of change uh, a catalyst or a medium is just a vector for something that is prior to the existence of the medium itself. Something that we we wanted to do, achieve something, but we didn't know really how to do. And at some point, we find, you know, um, an opportunity to do it because something is simplifying something or is um, 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 resembles as a, as an open door to for us to you know move in a certain direction, and then we do it. And and we can see like design in general in, in this kind of form. Like we say, we we, we create mediums for so, for someone to you know we we help them act. Sometimes we simplify it maybe too much, but we help them act, and and they and their motivation was prior to the action itself. And so the the medium has just at, you know plays just as a catalyst for for this action because we we made everything for for it to happen. You know. But then, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so we can we can have this discussion in this sense and words has the same potential to me. And, and metaphors especially are really interesting for this kind of use because 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 you 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 offer like opportunities for many people, which they have many different interpretation of the words to see something in the metaphor that applies to themselves. That if you use maybe something else, uh, what not the case, because it was excluding their point of view from from whatever you wanted them to convey, uh, something like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that. Well, I think there's two things there going on. One is the perception of an object in its meaning, as we know, is seated with the 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 you know the perceiver, right? 
that, you know, my wearing a mask was trampling on his freedom, clearly, mm. you know, but that's, but that's this kind of received like conditioning to how to interpret things in the world. Right. Um, and so if you, and, and they say that all this stuff is much more conditioned by your social circle than anything else, that it's really, really difficult to break through a social circle with, you know, directed messaging or anything like that. Yeah. I think the second topic is that notion of, you know, like, um, all models are wrong, but useful. But right? somehow useful. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but some are useful. Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, some are useful. Yeah, yes, yeah, some are useful. So the, this idea that, you know, you want to simplify something in relation to complexity is more to kind of like understand it for a brief moment. I don't know, mm. John, maybe John's floating in the sky there. I, I'm, I'm amused by the, <laughs> it looks like clouds behind John. And he has this kind of angelic quality right now, like he's part of a, he's part like of a birds, painting at the top of an apple or something, you know, it's like the fingers kind of, <laughs> but um, like, I, I, I know it's enough that that simplicity is enough just to keep your head from hurting for a small moment, you know, but not like a complete, it, there's, it, it doesn't serve to complete the picture. It serves to freeze something for a short amount of time so that you can mm. discuss something which doesn't lend itself to being contained linguistically, mm. maybe. Very interesting. Yeah, I'm just <clears throat> I'm just sitting here absorbing. <laughs> and yeah, I have an interesting backdrop. It's a it's a fabric that's on the wall that uh, I'm sitting um, in front of it. Uh, and I feel a bit spaced out in that sense because I'm in the clouds. It is. It is clouds. Okay. Yeah, I was. I was. The thought it might be. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, from from here, it I could have know. been. It could have been like flowers or something else. But yeah. Or seagulls. Um, yeah. I, I think it's a mixture of flowers and clouds. I don't quite know. It's kind of. It's abstract anyway. Wow. But um, so right in the topic, I'm, right? <laughs> But the, the reason I'm not uh, saying anything is um, I think the I know when to choose my discussions that I'm going to contribute to and I choose to do some and not others. And this is one that I'll just listen because it's kind of one of those ones that goes in all these different directions. I don't really have any opinions about this. So I'm just listening to what you say. And, and from the perspective of what I would tend to focus on, this isn't directly my area uh, in some ways it's kind of more about social issues and things like that which I tend to hmm. I tend not to go very public about because it's a um, whole different ball game kind of like blows my head off even just to think about it myself let alone talk about it um, and I think that that's where systems thinking comes in really interesting in that we all have such different perspectives and different understanding that hmm. I struggle with systems thinking with regard to organizations when you start talking about social issues and how people perceive the response to COVID and that I just like, oh my God, I don't know where to start the conversation. So <laughs> that's why I'm a bit quiet. I think uh, I'm a bit hung up on what Kevin said uh, regard, uh, regarding simplicity to make it simple enough to, to it, it, it's useful to make things simple so people can understand them. But actually you can go on this simplicity route to stop people from understanding things because understanding requires a level of depth of uh, let's say the the Kahneman systems to uh, groundwork to be able to very uh, daunting actually because it shuts off your ability to reason and you you want to sort of be able to to kind of overcome it. For example, in design, when we use it, we want people to just have this ease to, to process things, to, to move on further without feeling the need to to think. Mm -hmm. But I think when it comes to these uh, uh, I don't know, social systems and when you put them together to, 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 to try and connect them via these simple links, I think it's one of the most dangerous uh, decisions you can make because especially when we're talking about these very complex systems when they're in between changes so uh, yeah. after squid game i wanted to learn more about korean economy because like what the hell is that depth how can those people have these absurd amounts of debt and 
I was looking at it and it looks like they're in between these two systems, one very old that dates back to the Chosun period from like uh, 700 years ago, and they still haven't made up a way to, to, to come out of it. And now they're trying to readjust to you know, higher standards for everyone. But because of this discrepancy and transition, uh, they are not really successful. They are stuck in a very complex in between two very complex systems and the links are almost inexistent there are, there's a, a simplicity in between the systems there's a, a an ambiguity mm -hmm. that comes with the simplicity because there are no complex mechanisms to let's say include everyone include their own complexity you yeah. it's i don't know i don't know how to yeah. it. it's a yeah very, the, the, uh, the, um, their model is is when traditionalism meets capitalism mm -hmm. in some way, you know, like uh, exactly. highly structural, familial, and, uh, you know, like uh, highly structural way of seeing the world and really traditional way and cap capitalistic, uh, you know, uh, touch everywhere. And th that makes them, you know, as much competitive as detrimental for their population. It's it's some something weird, you know, this the a weird tension between their ability to create, you know, um like cultural coherent points uh for people to reflect and you know because the Squid Games is interesting in this way because it it, it is so popular so much that it's uh, you know ad nauseum. <laughs> and at the same time, uh, it's it's it relates to something so specific to their culture, but everyone can see something that they can experience about capitalism in some way in this um, you know in this um, uh, in this story you know and uh, this is interesting because their issues are really specific, but at the same time you you know everyone can feel something like akin to the to the situation in their life so like um yeah the depths the depths issue is you know their issues are more like older people like uh you know really old people and stuff like that and and young people that are just demo demotivated they don't want to they don't want to to go to school because they don't know what to do with their life because it's so hard to <laughs> have a life <laughs> actually so it's it's really interesting to see because this is not something that touch everyone in the world, you know. It's like, it's like, um, if you don't live in yeah, South Korea, you you don't this... you don't experience this the same way, you know. Well, I mean, no, not in the same way. But don't you think that there is a in that generation, in the kind of the generation that there is probably a greater level of financial insecurity now than there would have been prior, right? And that that's the thread. And this yeah. is a, a quote unquote, a solution, right? Like a corporate, like a, kind of like, like this is a corporation offering a solution is something other big corporations that are proposing solutions to our insecurities. Right? It's, it's, far, it's, it's, far, it's far, it's far beyond cooperation. Problem. It's far beyond cooperation. It's like society that accepts this as a, you know, as a, oh yeah, as a backdoor to the the situation, like as a as a way to escape yeah. the situation, right? Exactly. But the, but the fact that there's even this fiction that this is potentially a viable solution to that problem. Mm. is the part that I find kind of fascinating about Squid Game. It's like, I guess yeah. that's just like, you know what I mean? Like, this is this is a private corporation that's proposing a, a natural <laughs> rift, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's... But it's not something new I mean, either. It's yeah. not something new either. If you, if you, if you look at what's, what the same kind of, you know, filmography that you can find in in the U.S., for instance, like uh, The Purge and stuff like that. This is the same story in mm -hmm. the end, you know? 
It's like uh, you let you let uh, yeah, like society accepts some kind of something extreme as a you know as yeah. a, as a way to release tensions in the system, yeah. you know. Right. That's a that's a fascinating comparison between <clears throat> like there's no way in Korea you could have made the purge. And there's no way that in the U.S. you could have made Squid Game. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. That's fascinating. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. That's really super. But what about those game shows that are so like you know used to be more popular? Like I know this Japanese one, Majide. And they're calling these Americans for like I don't know two hundred thousand dollars or something, and they would just basically humiliate Americans in the weirdest challenges <laughs> and you know make them get hurt. Sometimes they would even break their ribs. You know, and no. they just had to fight Jeez. in that game. Yeah, I mean, it was an isolated case, but sometimes they <laughs> would get to win. Good game, the help, helplessness, and the humiliation of. Mm. Well, th- has everybody here seen Squid Game? Because I don't get. I've I haven't finished it, so. I won't. I won't. So. Yeah, so there is an insight into this that I think adds a really interesting wrinkle that we'll talk about once you finish this. But because it, it's, I, I had a view on the idea of the corporation and and, and you know, people yeah. subscribing to this that was very different at the beginning of the series than at the end. Mm-hmm. Not better or worse, but what happened with the participants and stuff like that. And yeah, it, it is it is kind of an interesting phenomenon when you like that's actually one of the things that I liked about it is that it it seems pretty simple at the beginning. I mean a little bit morbid, but it seems a relatively simple premise. And mm-hmm. it gets more complicated as you go along because you start to go of the choice of, of some of the stuff that's just staged just to make it more interesting. Some of the choices that get made. Um, by people at different times when they have choices, and that I think is what makes that that show much more fascinating than it, it originally seemed to me to be. And I think that that's what's almost kind of tying some of this stuff together. As you get down the path, this is where choices become what seems like an, an either a rational or a disagreeable choice on its own starts becoming part of people's identity mm. and starts part of, of, of a collective thing and then it becomes more interesting. It's like, you know, these the protests and stuff. What might have started with a few concerns that people might have had legitimacy, whether you believe in government overreach or vaccines or whatever, like all these things separately. But what ends up happening is, is that as this group comes together to share identity, and of course this is what creates social power, but also peril, because you end up all of a sudden finding that the people, the, the issues you're indexing on, if you will, are not the same ones that, that, that are most important to you, aren't it's something else. You start kind of going, well, I guess I'm aligned with this guy because, you know, yeah. we're sharing the same experience. So then all of a sudden you have people who are associating themselves with beliefs that they may not have held otherwise. But now they're kind of like, well, we're all in this together. And that's what I find so fascinating is how we sometimes find ourselves, um, you know, and it doesn't matter what the issue is, that we could find mm-hmm. ourselves part of a, of an organization or a profession or a, arguing for things that we might not have had otherwise because of the identity part of it. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's the, it's the, you know, it's the effect that we can call like shared understanding or collective understanding. It's like, although it's like here we are, we are, we are we are people from different backgrounds we have different understanding and different experiences but the fact that we share this space and now this discussion we can find oh did i miss sorry i lost you for a while um we can find like um a common ground of understanding each other 
although we might have different ideas at the beginning that informs our the way we will share information with others and we can disagree and at the same time agree you know in the same space with no issue with uh creating common sense you know it's like it's 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 really interesting and um Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that Squid Games is interesting. I just wanted to say that because I do feel like it's um, it's a false dichotomy to you know present it to us like as it is as as it was like um, something to counteract the effect of capitalism on Korea, on South Korea society because in fact it is a form of capitalism. You you have to play with the rules of the games that is proposed to the participants, and each time some people will be you know <laughs> uh, knocked out of the of the game because they they just they are not good at playing the the rules right. And in some way, I do feel like really ironic the fact that it is it is a game, as it is the same I mean the same form of game than you know. That what capitalism refers as a as free market, for instance, uh, and I do find it interesting because in the end, it's the it's the you know people will win the um, uh, the money that everyone owns, or uh, it's the shared money of everyone debts. I I I think, and each time someone get out of the game, you everyone get a more a, a bigger slice of the of the of the money, right? And so the mechanism is exactly the same as you could imagine with, you know, a given society and people playing with rules within this society and some people getting, you know, ahead of the game and having a bigger slice of the, of the, of the money, of the shared money of this, uh, of this um, society, right? So I do feel it's funny because in some ways, People are playing the same game <laughs> in the end. So, yeah, like that meta. That is, I think, <laughs> I think it's it's true. But there's one thing that it changes. You know, there's one variable that alters the Squid Game reality compared to ours, which is the uh, capitalism is on top of human life. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're just overwriting the value of life. And in our current society, we're allegedly, you know, still Uh, caring for human life and you know you just because you you have more money that doesn't make you entitled to killing others uh, there's no justification there is still morality so that's just uh, you know like ultra capitalism without any moral system and I think that's the only thing they do that's why it's so terrifyingly relatable and uh, it's not so extreme if you put it. it they just take out one simple variable which is this human morality Yeah. Well, what's interesting though about Squid Game? Hey John. Um, <laughs> Hi John. Is uh, it plays with a number of different things uh, at once? Is this idea that? Hey Cameron, uh, your mic is starting to fail a little bit. Oh. Yeah, I don't. We don't. Uh, at least on my side, I don't hear you well. Uh, Sometimes it's like um, robotic tints in your voice. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Let me try something here. It's the electronic virus. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the one with 5G in it, right? It's it's not the same as the other one, right? <laughs> well, we've all got to make up for the fact that Daft Punk broke up, so. Oh, yeah. 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 Our voice. I know. Sad. Hey, we gotta we gotta get our robot voices going. Yeah. So Cameron is is Daft Punk now. <laughs> hey, it? it sounds it better. Sounds yes. Better, yeah. yeah. Okay. Your podcast voice is back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. We use um, uh, I find wireless. The wireless um, headset is um. Great for listening, not as good on the mic end. It just doesn't doesn't do as well. But anyway, what I was going to say was that um, what I find so interesting about Squid Game is that it's the it's it's the game part of it. Is that like at one level it's 
is, the, you know, because they keep playing with, do I know what the rules are? Mm -hmm. And, and I think that that's what's so interesting is, is like, it, it's one thing to say, well, you know, if, if people are signing up to this competition, so they're given offered, there's a whole bunch of things out there that are available to people and you can be part of this competition. So they all signed up for this. And then they realize, oh, we're going to die if we lose the game. And then they, then they go, well, okay, I guess we're okay with this because we could, we, they can leave at any time. Like that's what's so interesting about this is, is they go, well, now that you've told me the rules are, I guess that's okay. I'm going to stay. But then, you know, with some of the games, they're like, well, you know, I don't know what's going on here. So now I don't know what the rules are. And I, the way it keeps playing yeah. with this whole thing about, well, what are the rules and, and that. You don't know exactly. They, they don't know. Anything. They don't know the rule. In fact, they just know one of the constraint of the of the whole game, whatever the rules are and might change in you know during the the episodes, is that if they fail, they they die. But it's not like a rule. It's a it's a major constraint to whatever they will play within the you know within the space that is given to them. So it's time like the the rules change. They don't know beforehand and they have to wait for people to lose life actually to know exactly what it entails you know and i do feel like yeah. it's really different from any free market where people are going you know like <laughs> you know happy to you know, try and 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 the, the only fact that diana said that it, it implies human lives and that you can relate to that because it's Oh, because it's human, you know, because we are all humans. And if we lose life, we, we can all relate to this kind of experience. Oh, now we lost Kevin. You do you hear me now? Do you hear me? Yeah, you're, you're breaking up. Are you on wireless headset too? No, but my connection is unstable. I don't know why. I oh, lose okay. you sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'll, but I, I just... Uh, Cameron, I you're just, on mute now. Yeah, I just find that... Um, I just find that it's interesting to say that... Uh, you 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 have this you know higher stakes of uh losing life and that's what makes the game more human in fact um uh, yeah it's it's yeah. it's interesting it's really interesting yeah that was that was the part that i kind of like after a few episodes i kind of got to i'm like one of the things that they might be trying to do is that is to suggest that the the rules inside the game are no more crazy than the rules outside the game mm -hmm. No. Right. That you know what I mean. That 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 while they're crafted, and and cruel, there there's an equivalence between the inside rules and the outside rules, and the fact that people will choose to actually be within the game, like clear, as opposed to being out in the world, which is cruel but uncertain and unclear, gives you an idea that there's an equivalence between the two yeah. states of being. Right. Yeah, and the stakes makes it, yeah, so it's, it's, in a way, more simplistic to, more simple to understand. Like, at least you know what yeah, you will really game, lose. Yeah, yeah you, you know what you will really lose in yeah. some way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That yeah. there's, a, yeah, there's a, that that they're equally cruel. One just happens to be more clear than the other. You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 But it, it's funny, but you know, the, like you said in the beginning, you wouldn't, it wouldn't make much sense to have a squid game in the U.S. because mm -hmm. in you know, people with deaths in Korea die. They are constantly harassed by lone mm -hmm. sharks and thugs, and they're mm -hmm. dying anyway. If they go there, they're like, they're chopping their fingers and stuff. So mm -hmm. that seems fine on either side. Yeah. yeah and in, yeah. The, in the US, you have that libertarian kind of streak where there is like, like and that, that goes back to the truck convoy here, anything in the States. It's this notion that no government is better than like having no government is better than having government essentially and no. the fact that the liber that they don't understand that you know that ends up in mogadishu yeah right, with warlords or like mad max or you know like like that's mm -hmm. really the you know when you push that to its extreme that's did, you did you see the um, did you see the video about anarcho capitalism the modernization of anarcho capitalism yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. it's exactly that. It's exactly that. Yeah. Yeah, you share can. Link. Yeah, of course, I can share the link. 
yeah i shared it in the the slack uh channel uh i do believe it's design or random overwhelmed <laughs> yeah yeah content. <laughs> i'm sorry sometimes it's uh even to me like I, 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 i'm just thinking like i shared already three articles in the link channel where i would put the next one <laughs> so it's the first <laughs> much to me as well <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. Sorry. Uh yeah. <sighs> But I'm thinking think about the design of the game, you know? Like I I'm curious what kind of designers do you bring together to create the game? And you know, what kind of empathy uh you know, what, what kind of empathic understanding do they bring to the table? Is there any empathy they put in the design because there is this human component. They are playing with humans but do they care for these humans to to have a, a good experience of the game because the only guy who has an experience is the actual creator the host which is the oh uh, I'll shut up because <laughs> Mark has no 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 my, my question no the question is <laughs> do you mean if Squidward was in the real world the person who actually designs the game or do you mean like the people who designed the game for Squid Game as a show like i was kind of trying to figure out like which designer we're talking about in which mm -hmm. world that was like because you were talking about it i'm yeah. like oh. like if 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 it was real and the corporation like designed you to design the game that would actually do this in real life exactly like we are you know hired by the company to create this game how do we think how do we design it <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's interesting because it's like it's like well what, you, you you have a very interesting client you know like yeah. well, they must be one million. i want one million <laughs> Oh yeah, well if you do that, you know that at some point there's sharks with lasers, right? So, <laughs> part of the game. But it's not effective. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. Uh, <laughs> Sorry guys. <laughs> A yeah. for us is the is the best. Uh yeah. Um it comes back to us, you know, as human beings. If we are to design this game in real life, it's it's you know, there is a possibility the designers of the world we live in have always had to think their their values and their priorities and consider life or disconsider it you know slavery as a mechanism was made by a form of design selves and see what are we actually valuing what we're bringing forward because it has an impact on the world and it Yeah, it, it also like it feels like if it was to happen in real life, you'd be in kind of like Milgram. Object to a party, and enough there would be a, a critical mass of people who would actually design the game. Right, like I think you could, I think you could find designers in the real world if you manipulated the context enough for them to feel like it's morally acceptable. And we don't have to go back more than sixty years to prove that. Right? Yeah. Like, so there's. Yeah, but yeah we got yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm just thinking that. Well, that um, that's a thought to uh, to get us. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking that uh, that to have some some game as 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 proposed in the in the TV show, you you need all the um, authoritative power that goes with it. You know, like you need uh, you need an army of people that are. Really to, willing to enforce the the rules, like you have in the show with these guys with the the masks and the and the face, um, yeah. and without it you won't have the the game because no one will be you know enforced to or to to play with the rules, right? Yeah. So it's a highly highly constrained environment that is maintainable 
in a short period of time. But it's not sustainable. It's not something that is made to be sustainable, right? So in terms of design, it's interesting. And this is where you can see, like, it's more like a, an architect that has full control over the constraints that he brings than designing social, you know, uh, in social systems, actually, because uh, it's it's rarely the case that it's it's as simple as just enforcing rules. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's rarely the case. So uh, where I, to reply to the question that Diana asked a while, uh, a while ago is uh, how do we see designers in this kind of in this, this kind of space is it's more like influencers of the of the social system than actually you know architects or um, you know designer in the sense that some people want uh, you know uh, mean it like the almighty godlike uh, designer that has that has the, the the you know the the power to 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 change the rules and make it apply to everyone even matter which is <laughs> Which is not the kind of superpower Power I, I, to I have. to manipulate a four Yeah, exactly. I think that's what struck me. Or, or even, even, even yeah. like what what people perceives is like, um, you know, an interesting point. You know, it's sometimes it's it's often the case that, you know, in the discussion about religions, that uh, the question you might ask is that if God really wanted us to believe in Him, He could just make make us you know, believe in him, you know, whatever are your beliefs, because because the, he, he's God, so he can make whatever he wants as rules, right? And so it's an interesting point in the sense that if we were, we were designers in this kind of sense, we could change people's perspe perceptions just by, you know, wanting to, which is not the, ca the case. We have to play with, we have to play with mediums for that. I lost you guys. Sorry. Are I'm sorry. Designers entitled, designers entitled to their opinion, right? Like, like, at what point do you? Because it's like, is it just like, you know, I will work with the client to do this and I will remain objective about it until it hits some kind of boundary, which is my moral limit, at which point I leave. Bye, Cameron. Bye, Cameron. I, I just... <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah, you too. Take care, everyone. I, bye, bye. Yeah, see you. Bye. I just, I, I find that's I kind of, that's kind of interesting, right? Like, like we're, at one point we're told to kind of like, not have not have opinions about the work right hmm. be kind of you know, you know like like as 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 designers that's one of the things you need to do is to remain objective and to you know you you choose a project that you're going to go into you make the choice at that point whether you're going to you know participate in the project or not based on some kind of business ethical criteria what or hmm. business and or ethical criteria but once you're in you kind of have to distance yourself a little bit from necessarily all about your taste or all about your, you know, your moral positioning or something like that. Like you have to give over at, at some point, but then at some point there's just like a line that you go, okay, now I'm just now, now it's, mm -hmm. now it's beyond what I will, what I will work mm -hmm. on. I thought that this project was this, now it's that, but it's almost like you're not allowed to have an opinion until you hit your limit and then you have to walk away. But yeah, it's not like, the frame of the, the having to stay objective. Is it really that no. we need to stay objective? Or it's no, better I, to actually know your opinions, to know what you might be opinionated about, or how do you react to certain opinions? Having this, you know, like bundle of opinions kind of in check makes you more objective than saying you stay detached and have no opinion at all. I'm oh, no, oh, no, no. I know. I, I, I'm not saying. I, I'm saying pretty much exactly that, that you, mm -hmm. that you have to like, you have to have a critical, you, you need a, a critical point of view 
lower lowercase c critical point of view to be able to judge whether the thing that you are doing is appropriate for the case or not because it's not really about taste it's about whether something is appropriate right as a matter of fact mm -hmm. it's one of the places where a lot of clients fall apart because they they judge what's happening based on their personal taste as opposed to the appropriateness of the message and the audience and the you know interface in there and so there is a certain objectivity but like you say it's a forced objectivity based on your experience of knowing a whole bunch of things but then removing yourself like filtering those tendencies in favor of what's appropriate yeah right so that there, is, I do, there is some kind of yeah i do agree that there's um some kind of message somewhere in the design community that you might be objective at some point about projects because mm -hmm. you have the you have the method methodological power to see things you know and uh, influence the project in some way that feels like you you might be objective about what should be done or, or not but i think it's more like and this is where i like um skepticism in its approach and you know having a like a, a methodological uh, doubts and and having um, an approach where you you hold your judgment on something until you can make a judgment about this thing. So it's not about not having an opinion. It's more like get, getting time, you know, buying some time to make a, an, an opinion that is based on something more than just opinions, you know, or at least yours, your prior opinion of, about what, what they think could be. But it's, yeah. But I don't think it's, it's necessarily objective in the end <clears throat> you know it's like yeah you you need this level of subjectivity you need it at some point you know so some sometimes you mm. you your subjectivity influence where how you will you know um what are the means that you will put in place for gaining this uh this uh critical judgment you were talking about. And so, because you, you have like a prior assumptions about the, the, the subject. Mm -hmm. And so I, this is where I, I probably sleep in the direction of, you know, um, Bayesian uh, thinking and stuff like that. Yeah. It's like you, you have to accept the fact that you have, you have a prior assumptions about what the thing is or could be. And the idea is just to wait, the, you know, the, having uh, some kind of means to weight your prior assumptions against other assumptions that were not yours at the beginning, but you can put in the, you know, put in and, and weight them. So where, this is where I, I do agree with what you are saying in some, in some way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's... I think that's awesome. No, no, because I think well, one of the one of the things that I think is an interesting topic is this notion of judgment, right? Because we do bring, we do have that. We have that responsibility, actually. And you say, like, we make shortcuts all the time based on patterns that we know exist mm -hmm. because we're working in in a when we're actually physically work, like not dreaming about stuff, but actually physically engaged in a project, we're always working in, we're always working in scarcity of some kind, right? There's even like all, all the kind of stuff. So, so we have no choice, but to take shortcuts, heuristics, yeah. Um, yeah. patterns that we understand that kind of thing. Right. And mm -hmm. I think that that, what you bring up is, is key that those that we're bringing that with us as a feature and not as a bug. Yeah. Right. Like, and so, yeah, so you're right. So it is to this notion of this kind of Bayesian updating to put yourself in the right position to question those patterns, question those, you know, assumptions and those heuristics as you get more information, if you can. Um, maybe I'm, maybe I'm kind of like in this mode now because I have like, like 10 user tests coming up in the next like <laughs> three days on a project. It's actually quite complicated. Yeah, and so I, I, I'm definitely in the mode of saying, like, we think this makes sense, and we've had a lot of internal conversations with the client about this. But I'm willing to be completely wrong about all of these assumptions in the next, you know, seventy-two hours. 
I mean, yeah. it would break my heart if I was. I have to admit, I'm kind of like, I'm hoping it's not the case. And that probably puts me in not the best kind of most open posture for this. But, you know. You but know, you, you yeah. can, but you, could, you could give uh, like a um, 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 likelihood score of your assumption. Like you say, yeah. it's, it's likely to happen this way based on what I know, all my prior experiences and this kind of topics, this kind of experiments in this kind of context, yeah. right? And you could you could easily assume things based on those with with the risk oh. of being wrong, of course. Yeah, yeah but, but you're making shortcuts out of those as well. The problem. Yeah, I'm, although, you know, like Kevin, just so you know, we do exactly that. When yeah, I build the script, for, for what I'm doing it, I'm specifically looking at those areas that have two things like certainty and risk. Those things which have highest risk and least certainty are the first things that I'm, the most important things that I'm asking about. And I actually have like, it's actually built like as a quadrant mm -hmm. of all the things. So like um, high risk, high uncertainty is up here, you know, like low risk, high uncertainty in that, like it's, I kind of build this like quadrangle and I put the, the topics kind of in there. So I do actually build it through that that method. But Dana, you're right. I am making an assumption about both risk and certainty. And and even I, if, I you take, if you take do it, you kind of have to do. If you take the scenario basis, well, well, you create a scenario based on what you expect things to be, right? And even that is uh, framing the test. So it's it's already okay. biased, you know, towards what you expect things to yeah. be. So. You, you know, the, the easiest assumptions you can make is um, if it's totally wrong. Oh, sorry. I lost you guys. Lost you. Sorry. <laughs> Do you hear me? Oh, now you're gone. Yeah. Now you're back. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, you, your, okay. your video kind of breaks off every once in a while. Yeah, and you just disappear. You just disappear and reappears. I don't know what is happening. Yeah, my condition is is really uh, unstable today. Uh, yeah, I was saying that uh, you can easily, uh, you know, assume that uh, if if it's if you are totally wrong about the scenario you created, people won't even try it. They will tell you, well, it makes no sense, right? Blah blah blah, mm -hmm. stuff like that, you know, and. <clears throat> But but you create a bias because you you are confirming already if people are willing to try you're already confirming that in some way you are not totally wrong about what you expected things to be. But there's a totally different way to approach it. You could say I release it to the world without any instructions on how to do it or what is the goal of this, and <laughs> you see just see what is happening, you know, and what people are telling you as stories about what is the thing that you created and mm -hmm. it is so scary that it's really hard to to sell it to you know actually it's, it's really hard to sell it to any clients right yeah. but it would be the the safest way to test things because now you 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 don't even just confirm or, or you know disconfirm what you believe you open the door for things that you didn't expect to be like people understanding things like in a way that you never thought people couldn't understand it, right? Like uh, people that are not exactly in the same context as the people you will test with. Uh, and they will but give you like... You have to alternate the, the, these ways. I think that's yeah. the, the, the muscle that you need to build. Yeah. Because, you know, Mark, I totally agree. We need assumptions. We do them anyway, regardless. You cannot escape them. Yeah. But uh, what I was saying is not to make them shortcuts, not to make shortcuts in assumptions to say that, yeah, that's going to happen. When you say that there's a likelihood, you created a gap so you can, you have time to think, you have time to question that it might not happen. But when, you know, I, I see a lot of people talking about things with a lot of certainty and they're yeah. making a lot of assumptions about what the others think, what the others do. And we do it in, in conversations, but sometimes it's useful to, create this space around it of probability of probably I'm wrong or I don't know. And I think the area of I don't know creates more valid assumptions than knowing. Yeah, but there's two things story. there. It's There's two things there that you are saying that is really, I, I do believe in what you are saying. And um, it's really interesting is 
for your own sake to do it, take the time to formulate things as likelihood and probabilities more than, as you say, as shortcuts in the, the way that it's easier to think like, like this. So you don't, you don't put in other options. And this is, this is where you take the space for that kind of thing. And also in the way you speak and the way you interact with others, to let the others think this way as well. You know, it's like more like a, not just for yourself, but the way you can interact with people. Sometimes some people are interact in a way that they, 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 in a way they ask you to take position for one of, you know, several options, although you just don't know. And by constraining you to take an, a position you will be forced to hold the position as long as you can, right? And this is where follow this is... the rules of the Squid Game. <laughs> exactly, yes. and 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 this is the this is the um, this is unfortunate that we sometimes interact this way. But you know, some people expect like cl so much clarity from 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 someone else, then they they force you to take a position that you that otherwise you wouldn't be so sure of it like you know you, you would say yeah i do think this like 50 percent like 60 percent right uh, it's not as easy as this mm -hmm. right um and yeah this is like the two that's taking the space but giving it to others is it is an interesting way to <clears throat> to approach it right so uh, i do agree with you diana yeah it, it's also weird with clients like there are two kinds of clients those who appreciate your uncertainty and those that say, well, why did I hire you if you didn't, if you don't know, <laughs> right? Like you end up in both those, you end up in both those camps. You kind of have yeah. to measure, you know? it's like, where are you? Cause I, yeah. I find like the more, the more advanced the client, the smarter the client, the more you can talk about uncertainties and probabilities and measuring yeah. and you know, that, that kind of thing. And the, and not only that, but really smart clients, and we've had a few, they, they understand in that uncertainty is the possibility for either kind of like greater success. They don't fear it. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. you could discover something that they don't know. We talk about these products as like learning engines that go out there and actually inform them about the market and, you know, how it's used and that it's a, that in the end, it's a kind of a collaboration between them and the audience and not like a broadcast medium. Yeah. And they, they get that. Whereas other clients like lose their shit if they don't have absolute control of the message and, and are not interested in, are not interested in hearing from us that we don't know exactly what the right solution is all the time immediately. Yeah. But I do think it's an um, issue with the, with business schools. People people coming from you know business schools and stuff like that is yeah. um, and this is where I do my personally I approach business people in general with the assumptions that they are highly ir irrational about how they perceive the world and you know the the opposite of what yeah. the saying goes you know like business people are rational because they look at numbers well no they yeah look at what they believe and they make the numbers confirm what they believe in general. Yeah. And, 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 you know, p business schools, uh, ask business, yeah, ask people to take like, like the strategy stuff or the vision stuff, you know, they ask to take the, the, the position, the prior belief that they will be right about what they are thinking about how the, thi the yeah. thing will go and to make whatever is possible at the hands to make it possible. Whereas people that learn it by, you know, by trying and, mm -hmm. and, you know, just have the good methods to approach it, but don't know, and they don't expect things to be clear. They approach it in this way to, you know, they, they don't have like a, a, a strong position, about how the, the thing should be, and they don't believe it. Like, no matter what, this is my strategy. Uh, they are like, they have like a, a direction and they see if the wind is going in the same direction and if it's not they 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 will move they they yeah. don't care about the you know the actual strategy they care about going in the right direction yeah. so they have just the compass to say this is right to me and after that they 
they see how they can make it, you know? And this is what, what I, when you say mature, uh, to me, it's like when you, you, you escape the, the, you know, the tools that were given to you at some point to, to yeah, view the, models, the world. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, yeah. you go beyond them and you know when to apply them. Because not the other way around. <laughs> it's like I have a tool and whatever I see is. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. There's, everything. I've got a hammer. Everything's a nail. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So you, you get these two two areas. What what can you do to assumptions? So I think it, there's this is where good and bad design happens. When mm. you do everything to validate assumptions, you might fall onto a very dangerous slippery slope of you know faking reality. But then yeah. you could also verify assumptions, which is based on this questioning on, on the judgment you're telling we're, we are talking about, Mark. And I think this ability to to think critically about yourself is, you know, the, the essential starting point. And then, you know, the, the assumption that reformula again, it goes back to the autonomy of the language. Mm -hmm. When you validate assumptions, you create tautologies. You just they are logically true, I guess but they make very little sense when you uh, bring them into a complex world that you might have to need to, to suspend judgment. So that's why when verifying assumptions is essential. So I think mm. you get a bit of both worlds. Yeah, I, I like to like... validate assumptions. It comes with yeah. instant gratification. I feel smart. I was like, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> but then it's verifying they're like, them. They're, they're true, but limited. Right? They're it's circular. Kind of yeah. Well, yeah. They're, they're like, they're, what you've done is like exclude all the other data that proves them to be false. And therefore, they are true in the cases that you have assembled, which is a very small world compared to the actual world. So they're kind of like true, but like within, you know, here as opposed to. Exactly. But then you, you have another layer to human you know, behavior, which is extrapolation. When you mm -hmm. have to apply it everywhere, you saw it working in like two cases, you know, like my assumptions are right. But then you're going to extrapolate on everything. So I think that's the contamination of what we do with this. Contamination of ideas, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Man. Well, I have so much to think about now. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go question my 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 own assumptions about life and my life choices. We'll see where that takes me. That that should make for some good sleep. Yeah, I'll have good dreams. <laughs> right um now now I have you guys, uh do you think we can have time in coming days to to discuss about the how do we make this discussion about the, the role of designers in society? Like all the discussions that can happen in this kind of big topic, um, we have to pick one and start with it. Uh, and I, I don't know which one um, and I would like to, that we design this kind of, you know, ground for discussion together. I don't know if you have time in the coming days or weeks so well, i'm like you know i'm open it's like community a, it's like on your on your spare time anyway i don't pay you so <laughs> yeah. yeah this week because i've got all these i've got all these tests this week it's a tough week yeah yeah like i understand user, user testing just destroys your week yeah it's like well when are they available oh, okay well get, get this 45 minute window in here right it like plugs it's like um it's like pasta in the little drain cap in your sink. You know, the little <laughs> bit that comes off to keep the water from running through? That's what user tests are like to my, to my schedule for the week. They just kind of get stuck in the thing. Um, also, I'm waiting for some... I might be able to do something on... Well, no. I was going to say, like, because it kind of has to be like this time. I suppose I could do, like, our normal time on Friday. But that's probably the only day this week. Next week is better. Yeah, yeah, I prefer next week. I'm a bit okay. booked this week as well. Yeah. Maybe I'm fine with that. Monday yeah, yeah. or Tuesday or uh, what do you got? Okay, let's have it. So if you want, guys, I, I sent um I can send you invitations like placeholder invitation for like uh, Monday, Tuesday, stuff like that, and see 
where most people are available. <laughs> it's a good way to do it, right? <laughs> you love yeah. spamming us with that, right? Yes, I love spamming you. You know, it's the it's the calendar analogy of you know uh, sending you know uh, throwing shit at the wall and see what is uh, sticking. It's exactly that, you know. I, I spam you, and at the end, I just have clarity on my agenda. I'm I'm just happy. It's mess on that, your side, but what, it's clarity on my side. <laughs> that's that's what my that's what my calendar looks like this week for all these proposed uh, meetings. It's just like boom, 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 boom. It's like forty five minute blocks, like every hour for these <laughs> testing. They just has filled up my schedule. And not only that, but the person who sets this up, who's, who's a representative of the client, because they have the relationships, what they've done is they've sent them all to me, like through Google uh, Calendar, but they don't update. So I have to mechanically go in, like oh. manually go in and like click them to update them to see if somebody's taken the spot or not. So uh, it's just like, pain. like it's my morning, pain. This morning was basically like <laughs> clicking on them. And like, oh, it's just, yeah, it's just, it just doesn't work at all because they, they don't have like, um, the, we, we tried to create like a Google, like a doodle where people could pick them off, but they haven't, it didn't work somehow. <laughs> I couldn't figure it out. So. Anyway. I feel you. The pain is real. Yeah, me too. After, after this kind of like lofty, after these kind of lofty discussions, there's the like wrestling Google calendar. <laughs> let's do let's do a squid game about this kind of thing like <laughs> how, can I, how, can I, how can i think about my ethics when i can't get my calendar to work <laughs> <laughs> oh, the struggle of everyday designer it is, yeah it is with the prosaic well good luck with your testing and hope you yeah, guys good luck. both have oh, a, a new, good way I just, there's, a, there's a there's a new hashtag for uh, for this trucking thing that's happening in, in Canada with this thing. It's called the Omicronvoy. You know, like a convoy? <laughs> oh, like, like, oh, like, no. like Omicronvoy. <laughs> now, uh, now the marketing campaign is complete. Did, did you see the my my uh, hashtag that makes total trend and on Twitter and everywhere? It's Shadowverse. Shadowverse. Yeah, you have Metaverse Chalet and we have the Chalet, oh. Chaletverse, right? No, it Chalet. didn't uh, have any trend anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't see it in the world. It has a trend. Uh, <laughs> it's not on my trending topics in Twitter. So. Yeah, no, it's what, only... what, is, what, is trending, what is trending right now is the uh, our prime minister uh, basically called this convoy an insult to intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's going well. <laughs> yeah, it's like not at all polarization of discourse, you know. <laughs> well, I think I think he realizes that uh, that the conservatives may have made a uh, a miscalculation by getting behind this convoy. It's a lot smaller than they thought. Like they were expecting, they said, "Well, there's going to be like a million people." Yeah, and that would be like one out of every you know thirty five Canadians, and that's just not going to happen. And I think <laughs> at the peak, at the peak, they had about fifteen thousand. So, yeah, it know. was like uh, we have a saying in French, but I don't know the translation. We have a pétard mouillé. It's like it didn't. It's like a dynamite, oh, but yeah, don't explode right. because it's it's wet. You know, something like that. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's like the same effect. Like you throw it and you expect a big boom and nothing happens. Okay. Hashtag. Hashtag. Where's the boom? <laughs> Where's the boom? Craziness. All right. Uh, okay, okay, guys. guys uh, whatever. Yeah, Monday, Monday or Tuesday are normal time. Yeah. I've, I've blocked the box I... right now, so yeah, you can send the uh, the holds. Okay. So be ready to be spammed on Monday and Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, wish you to get you to a good uh, rest of uh, the week. And um, yeah. yeah, good luck with your <laughs> with your painful uh, calendar thing, and uh, <laughs> yeah, and use the test. And Diana, I don't know what you are up to, but uh, good luck with whatever you have. Uh... <laughs> oh well, I will. Thank you, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye. Take care.